All right, hey everybody, it's Shinobi, and this is episode four of Shy Two Fifty Six. So last time I kind of made an abstract case for a meta layer protocol for Bitcoin, for lack of a better word, to help facilitate communication and linkages between different second layers. And so what I wanted to do in this video is kind of walk through that abstract case a little more concretely. And so two things I want to go through real quick before I get into that is, you know, one state of things regarding wallets and software in the space right now is obviously that, you know, each individual thing is its own complete separate piece of software. If you, if you want to use Coinbase's wallet and transfer balances internally, you have to use the separate Coinbase app. If you want to use a, a main chain wallet, you're going to have to use, you know, some other software. If you want to use Lightning Network, you're going to need a completely different, you know, wallet piece of software to do that. All of these things are not bundled into a single wallet. And that's something that's obviously going to change in the long term as all of these different things mature and people start building wallet software that bundles it all into one thing. And, you know, that that's going to kind of lead into the, this kind of meta layer I'm talking about. But... Also, before I go into a concrete example of this kind of being used, I want to just make sure that people understand how these two specific layers function. So a state chain and a variation on a Xiaomi and eCash server, <clears throat> because I need people to actually understand how those work to understand like going through and linking a payment across these different layers. And so a state chain is pretty much kind of like a federated mutation of a payment channel. In that in order to create a state chain, what you do is you, you pick a, a federation and a, and a group of people to do this, and you lock a UTXO on the main Bitcoin chain so that it can only be spent two ways. Um, it can be spent with a key that you have created and the federation both signing together and be spent immediately, or it can be spent to a key that only you have after a time delay. And the, the way that moving money in a state chain works is that key that works in tandem with the federation. If I want to, you know, send you money in the state chain, I physically give you that key and then have you communicate with the federation to generate your own pre-signed transaction that allows you to claim it immediately with the federation or by yourself through a time lock. And this is how a transfer works. Like every time you want to move the state chain to a new owner, you do this. And the trick is all of these pre-signed transactions utilize L2 to work like a payment channel um, that's not using penalties. So if you give me a state chain coin and then try to spend it uh, later with your pre-signed transaction, I can simply submit mine to the network and replace to spend yours and the money goes to me where it's supposed to. And so really the only weak point here is that theoretically the federation could collaborate with a previous owner to steal the coins immediately without the time lock allowing the, the legitimate owner to respond to it appropriately. And then the, the next thing I need people to understand is that this variation on a Xiaomi and eCash server design. And a Xiaomi and eCash server is pretty much just a, a centralized payment processing system that's designed to be completely private and untraceable. And so this variation I'm considering, it would work like this. You would generate a private key and a public key, and then you would blind that public key. So it's kind of just a mathematical operation that allows you to give that secreted information or that, that hidden information to somebody and have them sign it with a key. 
and then be able to take that signature and reverse it so that you can verify it on the unblinded information. So that when you give this, this key to the server and it signs it, it does not actually know the key that it's signing. But when you take that signature and reverse this blinding operation, you can still prove to somebody that this signature is valid from the server to the actual private key that you have. And so what you would do is you would take this key and the signature and save it. And that's like an actual coin or a cash note. And in order to spend it, you would take the, the private key that matches the, the public key you generated and sign it. So you would now have the public key, the signature from the server, and the signature from the matching private key, and you would give that to whoever you're paying. And they would take that, turn it into the server, and have their own token issued, and just repeat this on and on and on until somebody wanted to just redeem the coin for actual Bitcoin from the server. And so now that this is out of the way, I kind of want to walk people through a theoretical payment that's atomically hopping across multiple layers, like Lightning Network to a state chain through a Xiaomi and eCash server, and just kind of show how this is possible to atomically link all of these things together in a payment, but without some kind of meta protocol, like I was saying in the last video, there isn't really a, a way to coordinate or organize that. Okay, so everybody should know that a Lightning Network payment essentially works by pinging people along a route between two nodes in the network and committing to paying you money by creating a new output in that channel that's locked to a hash lock and also claimable by the person who is proposing it um, through a, a time lock period. And so you've created with this, this atomicity. Either this route gets all the way to the person who's trying to be um, receive money or you're trying to pay, and they release that hash lock and everybody can claim all their money at once, or it doesn't, and nobody along that route can claim their money except the people taking it back because the payment failed. So it, it, it's atomic, it does one thing or the other. And you can also do this kind of thing using adapter signatures with Schnorr signatures. So accomplishing the same thing, but just using a different technology to do that. Well, state chains require and utilize Schnorr signatures. And so would also be compatible with adapter signatures. And so there, there's no way um, or no reason that you you couldn't atomically link a state chain changing hands in the middle of a Lightning Network payment. So the payment hops through one payment channel to another payment channel to another payment channel. And then all of a sudden it gets to somebody who owns a state chain. And he goes, hey, I can give this state chain to John over here. And then he'll keep routing the payment through payment channels. There's absolutely nothing that prevents that from being done. But if you want to do that, you need to coordinate that. So how, how do you do the coordinating on the Lightning Network? You have this messaging protocol that allows Lightning nodes to advertise themselves, that allows them to advertise the routing channels that they have, which people build these big routing tables out of. So why couldn't that same messaging protocol also let me advertise that I own a state chain with Federation X or that I'm willing to accept any state chain from Federation X, Y, or Z. And when somebody's negotiating a lightning payment, it can just seamlessly take into account state chains too. That can just be part of the messaging protocol, the, the things that people advertise that um, you know, are included in things like a routing table. And you can do this kind of thing with a, a Chalmian server too. Like I could advertise, hey, I'm willing to accept a Chalmian token from any of these Chalmian servers out there. And the interesting thing is with, 
the model I laid out where you have to actually sign with a matching private key before you, you spend a token to, to prove that, you know, you, you did something um, to notarize the spend. You can add other types of notarizations to that. Like there's no reason that when you go blind the key to give to a server, you couldn't also have a hash lock included in that or a time lock. And as long as you trust the server to enforce that, this can all be atomically linked in, just like a state chain, into a, a lightning payment. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping you're starting to realize, you know, I keep coming back to like linked into a lightning payment, but really any of these things can just be linked together into a payment. And if you take this far enough, like, what is a is it a lightning payment or a state chain payment or a, a payment with a Chalmian token? It, it, all of those things are involved in accomplishing this payment from person A to person B. And you can even take this if if things were not complicated by regulations and laws, could even take this to such a crazy extreme as link somebody's Coinbase account into this, so that if I, if I get pinged with a, a proposed lightning payment, I can go, hey, wait a minute, I have money in my Coinbase account, so I can send that to Bob through Coinbase and he'll keep routing it through Lightning Network or whatever other step. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping now, you know, when you start to actually, you know, think about the whole example I walked through, like, what, what do you mean Lightning Network or State Chain or, Xiaomi and server, all of these things can just be a seamless mesh. One thing that interacts seamlessly together, even though if you look at it really closely, it is completely different pieces just fitting in together. And ultimately, this should be the end goal for second layers on Bitcoin. Like this is the, the degree of interoperability we should be shooting for. Because this is going to be the most seamless user experience, the, the least amount of frictions involved in people paying each other across different things. And so I think that's pretty much all I really have to say on this one today. But in the next episode I record, I'm going to take this kind of synergy between second layers. And instead of just talking purely about the interoperability of it, I'm going to look at just the kind of exponentially compounding scaling benefits that you can get from this kind of composition. And so I hope you guys enjoyed this one. And if the last video wasn't that clear or, or concise for you, I hope this helped clarify it. And I will see you guys next time. Adios.